The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts. This is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And this show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron, and we've got two great panelists tonight. Let me introduce them to you. Both newbies to the show, I believe. First up, we have proud NRA life member, former NRA employee, current government contractor, firearms instructor, Andy Lander. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. Happy to be here. Love it. Next up, director of the Personal Defense Network and EVP of 2AO.org. You know him, you love him. It's Rob Pincus. What's up? Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Glad to have you both. And I want to get right into the stories because we have a lot to cover tonight. But before I do, I want to remind everybody to check out the Patriot Patch Company. That's patriotpatch.co if you like patches, if you like uh, cool patches that will make you 75% more attractive to the ladies and up your charisma by a plus seven. I think you should definitely go check them out. First story, North Carolina bill would make pistol purchase permits more forgiving. This is, uh, you know, I actually didn't even realize that it was like this in North Carolina. So basically, if you have a pistol purchase permit, every single time you buy a firearm, you would have to fill out paperwork with the sheriff's department. And they have made a change now that they want to make a single permit good for five years, regardless of how many handguns the person buys. So you could go buy as many as you absolutely wanted without without any anything but having to do extra paperwork. So if you bought three guns in a day or you went to a gun show, you know, one day and bought a gun and then the next next day bought another gun, you would have to fill out information and paperwork with the sheriff's department every single time. So they're trying to decrease the bureaucracy uh, without taking any any freedoms away, which is what they say. Rob Pincus, I'll start with you. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that decreasing bureaucracy is always a great idea. Um, you know, we always have to just keep a real watchdog eye on how they're decreasing the bureaucracy. So in other words, if you think about, you know, the idea that uh, background checks were, you know, when they came in the, the, the being in the 90s and we started having background checks, people were really excited about, well, let me go out and get a concealed carry permit or do these other things so that I don't have to worry about waiting periods in some states or maybe I don't have to worry about uh, going through some other hoops w inside of certain states where, you know, you might need a, for example, I'm in Nebraska right now where you need a firearms purchase card unless you have a concealed carry permit. Well, one of the problems I have is where we start trading certain freedoms to make our lives easier. And that's the only thing I would worry about there, not being familiar with the details of how the system currently works versus how they want it to work. I just want to make sure we're not trading, uh, you know, one freedom for another. Andy, what are your thoughts? Oh, he's gone. Bye, Andy. <laughs> I love that guy. I don't know why he left. I, I just looked right over. Oh, there he is. He's back. Andy's back. So did you, have you, did you even know that it was like that in North Carolina, Andy? Uh, well, I didn't hear a word Rob said again. I, I don't know what's uh, what's right, but are you talking about the, uh, the if you have a permit to uh, carry, you can uh, bypass the whole uh, handgun thing? Yeah, but you have to fill out paperwork with the sheriff for every single gun you buy. Uh, I knew on my trips there, I knew they had done something like that. Uh, I, I I didn't know that was now the case. So, um, they're no, good. I did. It looks like they're getting rid of it now. Uh, it'll last for five years, and you can buy as many guns as you as you want to without having to fill out the extra paperwork, which isn't a, a yay or a nay of whether you can buy the gun. But I just thought it was kind of interesting. I kind of figured North Carolina would be, you know, a bastion of freedom, and there's silly laws everywhere. Yes, there are. Senator Lindsey Graham introduces FFL Protection Act of 2019, and the NSS approve NSSF approves. So this one is uh, he introduced a bill that would increase penalties for thefts from FFL holders, which clearly already illegal, but this would increase the penalty for those. Andy, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, absolutely a good thing. People that are stealing guns need to go to jail and they need to stay there. Yeah, 100% agree. Uh, the numbers I was actually pretty pretty surprised about. There was, there's been a 71% increase in the number of thefts from FFLs from 2013 to 2017. Uh, which peaked at 577. In 2018, the number fell to 427, which is a 26% drop, but still well above 338 in 2013. 6,000 firearms were stolen from FFLs and burglaries, burglaries and robberies in 2018, 
Rob Pincus, did you know that it was uh, that widespread? Yeah, I did know that there's been a dramatic increase. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things that happens when I travel around on tour and I get to spend a lot of time at different gun shops around the country is I hear these stories. I was just in uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, and they have a very secure building. They are they're very centrally located. They have a great response time from their local police, but they've even had some attempts uh, at break-ins and, and the, all their security procedures, including their physical security procedures have worked. But uh, I also know that law enforcement and the local dealers, the FFLs, are starting to pay more attention to this. So I know right you know, in Colorado, in our home state there, uh, we've had a lot of problems with this as well, uh, both down you know, in the Springs and up in Denver. So we, we've seen this all over the country, and I'm glad to see that it's being you know, sort of responded to. At the end of the day, though, kind of like Andy said, I mean, stealing guns is illegal. Let's, let's enforce the laws on the books, right? I mean, if you, you put a vote up in front of me, whether I get different penalties for people who do breaking and entering and burglary and robbery of FFL, or let's actually prosecute people who lie on 4473s. I want that. Let's use the laws on the books more than we do now. Yeah, without question. Still, uh, in, I guess some good news here. The Vermont governor vetoes waiting period bill. This comes to us from the NRA ILA and Governor Phil Scott vetoed S-169, which was created a 24-hour waiting period on handguns. I think we mostly probably I'm just assuming here that you guys feel the same way that I do. But I think that waiting periods don't really do anything. They haven't demonstrated any real impact on public safety that I've seen or that anyone else could prove was tangible. And uh, Andy, what are your thoughts here? Good thing, bad thing? No, they're they're absolutely a detriment. Uh, any waiting period whatsoever. I've had personal experience. So I've worked behind a couple gun counters and uh, I've heard people coming in and, and are absolutely terrified uh, for their own personal safety, whether it's a, somebody that, um, that uh, is stalking them and, and they need a gun. They need a gun, period. They, don't, they can't wait. And uh, I, I just believe that waiting periods, one, they don't, they don't curb any, any type of uh, violence or anything and they don't have that cooling, that cooling off effect. Uh, but people that need the gun right now uh, don't get it. In New Jersey, they just had, uh, I believe, a lady that was, uh, she was in her six-month waiting period, and uh, she was she was murdered. Uh, so, you know, I, I have to explain this to people all the time. I say in Virginia, we go through an NCI, uh, we go through a national insta check, just like everybody in every state. New York does the same thing. Why does it take, in Virginia, 15 minutes, and it takes uh, seven months in uh, New York State, which is basically the same thing? It's basically... It's trying to discourage you not to buy a gun. That's basically what it's doing. Yeah, I, I think that we're both in agreement. Rob, what are your thoughts? Yeah, waiting periods are an infringement period. Um, you know, Vermont's the first state I could legally carry in. So to the original constitutional carry state, uh, it kind of like even the fact that this was being considered to me was like you know, kind of just emotionally painful. Now, you know, we know that there are issues with with suicide prevention that are affected by delaying one's access to a firearm. But there are so few instances where you might be able to draw an actual correlation to a waiting period being a stopgap when you can walk over to the other counter and rent a gun and use it right away. That even being involved in a lot of the mental health stuff, I see that that flag kind of waved far too often from you know those who are pro gun control and even people in the mental health world will say you know, it's about the the avenues of access you have and just blocking one uh, or even potentially blocking one doesn't really affect it. So just as a caveat to people who've seen some of the stuff come through, some of our allies on the mental health side with Walk to Talk America, uh, there is no indication that waiting periods being instituted is going to have any significant statistical effect on suicides either. So 100% and, and definitely glad Vermont maintained their status there. Yeah, definitely. Um, House measure seeks to repeal the Gun-Free School Zones Act. I thought this was kind of interesting. Comes to us from guns.com, but this measure uh, would basically just scrap the federal gun-free zone rules when passing within a thousand feet of a school. And this was public, private, and parochial elementary and high schools nationwide. Um, it's been introduced. Clearly, it's going to have a long path and a long row in front of it. Uh, this basically just allows the federal government to bug out and let states do the things that they're going to do to protect the schools or not protect the schools, as it were. Andy, do you have thoughts on this? I believe that the gun free uh, gun free zone thing is a farce. You know, even if you have a sign up that says gun free zone, if you don't believe there's a gun in your school, uh, you need to <laughs> uh, you probably need your head examined. I mean, people if, if somebody wants to bring a gun to school, they're going to get a gun in school. That's it. And and the question is, do you want it just just the bad guy to have a gun, 
or, or the kid that's uh, intent on doing bad things or, or the, the criminal intent on doing bad things? Or do you want the, the good guys with the guns? Uh, so they, they need to just get rid of the gun free zone thing. That's just, that's, you know, but I think in the 1980s, uh, you know, airplane pilots were required to carry guns when they were carrying U.S. mail back like before 1985 or something like that. Uh, I remember reading and, and, and you didn't see a lot of hijacked aircraft. And then after that, all of a sudden, you know, there was a, there was a change. I'm sorry. Pilots were allowed to carry guns in the cockpit is, is what I meant. But uh, yeah, the whole thing about gun free zones, uh, that just needs to go away because um, it's not a reality. Yeah. I'm definitely with you on that. Rob, do you, what do you think of this? And do you think it has any chance to actually pass? Well, I think that's the important part, right? Is does it have any chance to pass? I, I don't, I don't see how that, you know, there's a great website. I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but it's kind of like gives you the the chances of bills, either making it out of committee or get making it, you know, through both houses and actually making your law. I got to imagine this one's in the single digits on percentages. It'd be great if it went away. You know, I, I wouldn't put much money on it, but I would expect that to win big. The, the odds on this one are against it in Vegas. I'm sure. Yeah. Coming to us from Illinois, Deerfield, Illinois, assault weapons ban appeal gets dismissed. So they basically banned assault weapons in their hamlet of Deerfield. And uh, that basically they came through and put an injunction on it, said, nope, that, that is not going to work. They appealed it. And now uh, the let's see, the second district appellate court has dismissed this attempt and they dismissed it for lack of jurisdiction, but man, Deerfield just will not give up. Rob, are you familiar with them and what, they, what they've tried yeah, to do? Very, very familiar with this case. Really important case because it was a preemption case, essentially. What happened was uh, Illinois, all the municipalities were given a window of opportunity to establish like storage laws, especially and specifically. And if they had even wanted to, let's say, ban a certain type of firearm by saying you can't store a certain type of firearm inside a municipality, they would have had a court fight back then. But because of the way the rules were written in Illinois, they had already closed that rule, that opportunity to really do anything significant in terms of storage laws inside of any of the municipalities. So that window had closed. They were trying to, quote unquote, rewrite the storage law, but really create a ban for certain types of firearms inside of the city. And uh, that was shut down. And that was a, it was a well fought fight by uh, the Illinois State Rifle Association. And uh, Second Amendment Foundation, of course, other people I'm sure signed on to that as well. But I know they did a lot of the heavy lifting in the early work. And especially Second Amendment Foundation kept pushing for the dismissal uh, because obviously the injunction, a lot of people hear that and then it is relaxed. Oh, OK, we've won. Well, now we've won. So that was that was a uh, good news to come out and find out that this is now apparently completely done. And Deerfield's going to have to maybe try something else. But this route has been closed off to them, even though it was technically closed once before they, they tried an end to run and didn't work. Yep, very good. Andy, thoughts? Uh, man, I feel like I've been out of the game. I, I did hear a blip about this, but uh, you know, the assault weapons ban. I, I'm I'm pretty anti, um, get, you know, assault weapons as far as uh, being having them banned. I guess I always uh, like to tell students that uh, assault weapon is is basically a manufactured term by uh, a group of individuals back in the early '90s that was uh, trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the uh, less less knowing. Uh, you know, it was the 1994 crime bill. So as far as I'm concerned, the, uh, anything when it comes to that, uh, kind of needs to be shot down. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really unfamiliar with that particular case, but, um, I, I'm not for banning any type of semi-automatic standard capacity or even guns that just hold 30 rounds. Um, I'm, I'm for trying to overturn that stuff. Yep, definitely. Armed Good Samaritan comes to the aid of a Missouri police officer that was shot by an inmate. This actually has been uh, some new information that's come out on this. So inmate gets shot or inmate gets gun away from officer, officer gets shot. A uh, witness basically reports and says, hey, one of these good Samaritans was able to control the situation because he carried his own gun. And you would think that this comes from guns.com or ammo land or something like that because it does seem heavily uh, pro 2A. Uh, but no, it comes from KCTV, which is the, the Channel 5 station there locally, that affiliate. Uh, she further says that she posted the information not to make a political statement about guns, but to tell the truth about what happened and how conceal and carry can help in dangerous situations. Uh, Andy, what are your thoughts? Conceal carry a good idea? Uh, yes, absolutely. Sorry, I apologize. My dog was going back crazy at the back door. That's why I've been running back and forth. No, I, I did see that. Uh, at first, when I read that article, I was like, Trenton, how's that, how's that possible? And then I was, oh, wait, it's Trenton, Missouri, not Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> But uh, no, I, I believe that uh, you know citizens, we need we need to have we need to carry and, and to an extent we need to be able to come to the aid of others in case there is a time 
that somebody's in need that that does it. I don't think you should be po poking your nose in everybody's business, but uh, you know, bad people do bad things, and uh, bad people stop doing bad things if enough people stand up and start fighting back. I mean, look what happened to uh, active shooter back in Dallas uh, two days ago. You know, that guy went in. He wanted a body count. And uh, he met up with some people that had uh, had uh, returned fire, and yeah. uh, he uh, he didn't last long. Yeah, so. I definitely want to talk about that one in detail. Uh, Rob, what do you think about uh, Good Samaritan coming to the aid of an officer that had been shot? Um, you know, I mean, it, it's one of those very very careful things we got to talk about. You know, we want to caution people against you know as, as they get getting involved in things they really don't know what's going on. But I always say in every class, you know, we're teaching, we're talking about defending yourself or those that you care about. That doesn't just mean your family, right? In the moment, you look over and you see someone that you can help, you know, police officer in uniform, you know, clearly being overpowered or someone's taken their, their weapon or injured them. Obviously, there's a, there's a compelling, you know, interest in caring about that human being, just as a human being, but maybe particularly because they are the person who's you know, taking the oath and they have the lights and they have the badge and you feel compelled to act. I wouldn't ever say to someone that they're completely 100% wrong for doing that. But I also wouldn't suggest that just because you carry uh, a gun, you you are now, uh, you know, sanctioned to run towards the gunfire and always try to get involved. I think we have to be careful about that. So it's a balancing act, you know, for sure. It sounds like this was a good story. And I think for me, the most interesting part of that is the media aspect of the truth being told because we hear so much, you know, so much fear mongering and kind of like victimization, victim mentality inside of our community that they, the mainstream media, nobody ever talks about this. So, so good on you for finding a story where, you know, and I think there are many examples where, where the truth is simply told and shared. And, you know, it may not be that big a deal to the average person. To us, it's a big deal because we care about these things. So we want to see it, you know, 24 hour news cycle, the whole thing, but we won't get that. But because it's an incidental story to most people, but but these stories do get shared a lot more than I think people give general media the credit for. Yeah. All right. This next one I just thought was kind of interesting. 18 people showed up for Representative Swalwell's gun control speech. This is a person who wants to run for president of the United States of America. He is uh he had a had a little rally kind of thing, and the the pictures are truly pathetic. The 18 people showed up. He pushed a gun ban and buyback for every single assault weapon i say with air quotes uh and he says making sure first and foremost no more assault weapons are manufactured with the plan to buy back the 15 million that are in circulation in our communities today so clearly he is speaking to a very passionate audience uh and i don't really think anyone cares rob what do you think i don't i first of all like 15 million? I don't even, what does he count? I, I'd love to hear his definition of an assault weapon because a lot of the times I hear assault weapon from anti-gun or pro-gun control people, they're talking about things that I think are approaching 100 million guns out there out of the 350 million guns in America. Yeah. In the auto, stuff like that. So I, I don't think this guy has really much clue on gun control. He obviously doesn't know how to run a rally. My number one comment was I think at this point, we could have a rally out in front of the NRA headquarters with American gun owners that are more concerned about making the NRA better. We could have a much bigger rally than he had to get end gun, you know, gun rights. Yeah. Andy, what are your thoughts here? Uh, I think the guy is trying to appeal to a certain extreme crowd, kind of, kind of maybe on the flip side of what happened in the last election with, with Donald Trump sort of, but, uh, but uh, yeah, first of all, how, how are you going to get those, how are you going to enforce that? Uh, how are you going to get people to turn in guns? What's, what are you going to do? You, you have to pay people back 15 million. Let's just say it's 15 million. Let's say you have to pay somebody back what they're worth. I mean, we're talking, millions, possibly billions of dollars to do that. And then uh, who's going to enforce it? I mean, these politicians want to get, uh, you know, they want somebody else to go do the dirty work. They don't, they don't want to actually do it themselves. Uh, I think it's a, it's a pipe dream. Um, he's trying to appeal to certain individuals, uh, getting ready, trying to uh, kind of put his toe in the water, see what people think about uh, gun control uh, as far as gun legislation is coming up for the next election. I, I don't think he's got a chance. Um, you know, I, I think he's fishing. Yeah, term I can use. Say, I mean, let's say an average uh, gun costs a thousand dollars. The average of those fifteen million. I mean, that's fifteen billion dollars. Uh, yeah. We'll say five hundred is what they're going to give. That's seven point five billion dollars. So yeah, he, he is an idiot, and I'm not afraid to say it. Let's move into some uh, less than positive news. Although I kind of, my personal opinion is that this is in the positive news segment. But gunman that targeted Dallas courthouse is killed during shootout. Um, so guy decked out in a you know, face mask and had a bunch of magazines and a, some kind of AR-15. He rolls up to this federal building and decides to shoot inside of it. 
and uh, quickly realizes that it was it was a pretty bad idea for him to do that because he is now dead. No one else is dead, and he has been uh, caught on fire by the meme pages that are out there. Now, Andy, uh, one of the reasons I asked you on the show is because uh, of something that I saw on your Facebook. Yeah, why don't you kind of tell us how how you're associated or related with the story? Okay, so. Uh- Monday, shortly after about uh, 12 o'clock, uh, we got uh, all the instructors for the fire instructors for the company that I work for, uh, got an email from our, our vice president of training. And it said that four of our contracted officers that we provide uh, to, to the federal government to protect their federal buildings had been involved in an active shooter. Uh, turns out that those uh, that was the Dallas shooting. Um, the media, I, I went online and there wasn't, at the time I got the email, there wasn't much being really reported at all. And I had to wait about two hours. I'm like, man, I just got this email from my boss. It should be all over the place. And then I waited and I, I saw the first, I think, uh, I think it was, uh, possibly ABC or NBC and they reported, uh, you know, that, uh, that there was an active shooting at the Earl Cabell, uh, federal building in Dallas. Well, uh, the news initially reported, as the news gets everything wrong, you know, they said, I think the first report was uh, FPS, which is the Federal Protective Service, which is basically the inspectors, uh, but they're also a police service for the federal government. But they, they're the inspectors that inspect uh, the contracted uh, security. They said FPS had, been, had taken down, and then they actually used terms like federal officers and things like that. But from what I understand, I haven't got the full report. We uh, actually just sent our active shooter instructor for the company down there today with the vice president to kind of do a um, – uh, after action report with the people that were on scene. And uh, so we'll kind of get the full details, lessons learned, things like that. But uh, it found out, no, it was our guys that got involved with that. Uh, from what uh, the what I've kind of put together, and again, I'm getting pieces from different people. Uh, there's a couple photos out there of, of different um, people. One, one of them is a picture of a, of a big uh, uh, African-American uh, PSO, which stands for Protective Service Officer. And he's kind of looks like he's, he's dodging left or dodging right. Uh, if you actually look in the background, he's um, the, the shooter is actually shooting at him. Uh, you can see behind right. the car, and uh, he's taking rounds above his head. So and people have kind of crucified him and saying, "Oh, this guy's run away." No, he's actually evacuating. We got the word that there were four of our guys on duty at the time, and one of them evacuated everybody, and three other guys engaged. Uh, I mean, that guy did his job. He did what he was trained to do: evacuate immediate area civilians. Nobody got hurt, uh, and then uh, our guys returned fire and. Um, you know, uh, I, I can only uh, judge based on what um, I've seen in the photos. The guy had some type of tactical gear. Uh, it looks like he had some type of vest with um, that possibly could have contained body armor. I don't know yet, but um, I, I'm not sure if they snuck one in on him through the uh, uh, through the thoracic cavity under the elbow or under the armpit, or if he got uh, punched in the uh, or if he got center punched based on some of the photos with the with the bullet hole in the center of the chest, but, but, but somebody got in on him. Somebody, somebody took him down and it was, uh, it was a uh, good guys, uh, one and bad guys zero. And uh, by the, by the way, the, the thing that I heard actually from a, uh, an ice officer today was, um, and again, I haven't validated this. The, the media has shown a picture of this guy with, I think like 10 magazines. Rumor is he had 40. Dang. Um, I don't know where those were, if they were in his car or whatever, but, um, you know, the guy was loaded for bear. So, <laughs> Rob Pinkett. I think I, I yeah I was fascinated uh, to hear from Andy yesterday that the uh, private security was involved and obviously the news kind of flow to kind of react to that and it was unfortunate I was talking to Andy I guess last night about the uh, the guy who was um, in that one picture it, you know it's just an unfortunate timing you know how it is like you can take one freeze frame out of that video. And it can look completely ridiculous and be sensationalized. But Andy pointed out, we're like, literally, there is the gunman. Yeah. Literally, there's spray coming off the building. And if I'm going to be nitpicky and say, well, why Why is it, you know, you get that reaction, I get it. If that was the moment the in- round impacted above your head, I mean, that's what we teach, right? You teach you to embrace and accept that you're going to do that. That dude's doing all those natural reaction things. And maybe like a 20th of a second later, he's already turning and reaching for his gun. I don't know. So I thought that was an unfortunate and potentially unfair picture, especially in light of, everything that's gone on now with Broward County, with that guy who we have 17 minutes of video of him standing behind a wall doing nothing. And I think a lot of people right away, oh, that guy might, did he work for Broward County was kind of some of the stuff I saw. And it's like, you know, not fair with a, screen, with a, with a simple you know, shot. And I think that's really 
it's an important reminder to us when we see pictures of, you know, even stuff we post from range or we see pictures in a, from a dash camera video, let's see the video. Let's, let's hear the context. Let's understand the big picture. And uh, it's, that's an important reminder. So good job uh, to your guys, Annie. Thanks for sharing that inside information too. Now there is one, one criticism and I don't even want to call it criticism because frankly, to be honest, there really is no criticism because again, bad guy zero, good guys one. Uh, good guys uh, two alpha. Yeah. I mean, you know, a couple guys so, showed me a picture. In fact, there's a picture out there with the three of our guys, uh, two of them, you can see have their guns drawn. There's a guy in a, in a, in a jacket and he's got a U.S. Marshal lanyard. Um, now, I don't know this for fact, but but I do know that I don't actually think that's a U.S. Marshal. We have a contract that we uh, – it's called a CSO. It's a court service officer. And our guys are specifically assigned to the marshals. Now, they have jurisdiction inside the federal courthouse. They dress like marshals. They wear the lanyard uh, that say U.S. Marshals on them. But um, I don't actually think he was a U.S. Marshal. I think he was actually a, a one of our guys that was um, – being in the court position, he was a contracted officer. Um, now, the one criticism I have, and I hate to say criticism, but if you watch the ground video where the where the reporter actually ignored the advice of the officer saying, come inside and get safe, that he went across the street and he started filming the guy on the ground. If you look at that video, that same CSO is standing over him, and he's like focused. He's, he's standing there for a few minutes. He's just staring at the guy. Again, um, I wasn't there, you know, I'm sure in the moment people had some emotions going, but uh, one of the things that, one of the lessons we can take away from that is, is if something like that happens and there's a bad guy on the ground and you're, you need to find work. What I mean by that is you need to, if somebody, if two guys are working on that guy and you're just standing there staring, you need to do something else besides just stare. You need to go out and maybe look for somebody else. Okay. You don't have to post up or anything like that, but you need to go out and find, find, find a different job. Find a different work. What, what I mean by that is, you know, look around, maybe possibly look and see if the guy had another handgun. He dropped under a car or something like that. But just standing there staring is probably not a good thing. But, again, that's just a, a small critique, um, you know. Um, no, I get it. I don't 100%. know. Um, so, the, I mean, the guy that was getting shot at and someone snapped a picture of him, like, mid, mid getting shot at. Um, I, I'm just yelling serpentine, bro. Like, do your thing. I, I don't care. Like, just get away from the shooter and then turn around and do. So I, I did. I saw the picture. I didn't think anything critically of him at all. And like, do whatever you need to do. I do want to bring up one more thing that I'd like to discuss with you guys on this. And I think I just started thinking about this today. I don't know if maybe I just read it somewhere and stole someone else's idea, but I think that the response to this criminal has been amazing in the public eye. And maybe it's just because I live in an echo chamber and I see all the, all the gun pages and, and everything doing things, but this guy has been memed um, and mocked and made fun of. And I've seen pictures of the dead individual multiple times that have been memed and made fun of. We always talk about mainstream media or just media glorification of the killers by saying their names and talking about their body counts and doing all this and doing all that. And now for the first time ever, and maybe it's just because he was not very good at what he was trying to do. We, we see just the pure mockery, which is the, the opposite of that. Do you think, and I'll start with you, Rob Pincus, do you think that maybe this is the start of something new or is it just because he just, you know, clearly seemed way out of his, uh, way out of his comfort zone. Uh, do you think that the, the mockery of this killer is a, a good thing and B maybe the, a turnaround of that glorification principle? I think I'm going to go in a direction. I don't normally go because I, I don't like to empower like some of the fear safe space, you know, kind of thing, right. The political correctness. But let me just say if, if the same thing, the same thing kind of was done with the uh, would be uh, spree killer that flew up from Florida and came up to Denver around the anniversary of Columbine. But because of the nature of, you know, who she was and the way she, you know, uh, killed herself with the gun and, and the way that ended, it didn't really get any traction. It was harder to make fun of her because she was more of a sympathetic, you know, young girl that was obviously troubled. Um, the uh, trans uh, gender person that was that shot the Denver STEM school at the young girl guy, 16 year old, like there was some mockery there of just the lifestyle and things like that. And obviously that wasn't tolerated. That was sort of stamped out because it was denigrating her as a you know human and not as a killer or he as a killer or however you want to go down that road. It was there were issues there because of the the, the race or the gender or whatever you want to say of, with a lot of shooters. And I think when you start breathing, this guy was like a white guy, veteran, you know, over you know, all the tactical gear you could buy, you know, 
sportsman's guide for $20. I mean, all the things were lined up. Nobody's there to defend this guy, right? Nobody's going to stand up and say, but he was a veteran. In fact, a lot of people were acting like, you know, he wasn't. Well, he raised his hand. He, he gave that oath. He did all those things. But this guy has like no sympathy whatsoever. No group who wants to defend him or claim him or feel sympathetic for him. I think if we tried to do the same thing with a lot of other spree killers, we'd, we'd find ourselves, you know, being told we were callous and we are not helping solve the problem. So I think from... From that standpoint, on this one, you know, we all get a pass. I don't know that it's a trend that we're going to be able to see, you know, go anywhere, nor should it, because we're really we're, we're, we're denigrating the person as opposed to the act. And I think the act is what we need to be focused on and getting people to help. But obviously, this guy needed some kind of help beforehand and we wouldn't have had this. And I think that's important to stay. And that's not maybe what I'm supposed to say or where we were going with it or where the Internet memes want to be. But I think that's the right place to be. Awesome. Andy, thoughts on that on that aspect? Uh, I actually agree with Rob on this. I, I'm actually kind of torn uh, because one, we, we actually don't know. Maybe this guy was actually just wanting to commit suicide by cop. You know, yeah. uh, we don't know. Dead man tell no tales, so we can't go back and ask him. But uh, the, then there's the other side of the coin that uh, any publicity, whether negative or positive, is is good publicity. You know, so somebody that's a copycat could see that and say, "Well, this guy is a is is now a, a meme legend." You know, I want to be one too. I don't know. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of torn. I mean, yeah, the guys, the guy did uh, take an oath. However, I, I think he, he kind of violated that oath when he uh, decided to take up arms and, and shoot at uh, people. But, um, you know, it's a tough one. I, I, I guess the safe, the safe bet is to just, to just, uh, to just not, not mention his name. I guess yeah. that's the safe bet yeah. uh, to, to possibly discourage others. But, um, you know, the internet's going to do what the internet does. And, and that's the problem is, uh, you know, uh, I'm not the internet police. I don't, <laughs> I don't think Rob's the internet police. Uh, in fact, I was reading an article about the internet police down in Florida and apparently people are having heart attacks at age 40. I so. am the internet police for the gun community. So I've taken on that, that mantle. I will, I'll gladly be that guy. <laughs> I love it. So. All right. Good. Uh, good talk guys. Thank you very much for your opinions there. Uh, Gun Owners of America has serious concerns over Trump's anti-gun pick to head up the ATF. Uh, this is the, the Trump. He has nominated the Fraternal Order of Police President Chuck Canterbury to head the ATF. Uh, Gun Owners of America Legislative Council Mike Hammond maintains that he's demonstrated a strong anti-gun bias as head of the FOP. And I, he says, and I quote, he certainly opposed aspects of the constitutional carry legislation that's being proposed in Ohio. He went up and did a happy dance on behalf of Sonia Sotomayor when she was nominated for the Supreme Court and Eric Holder when he was nominated as Attorney General. And he seems to fall within the trend of Trump nominating anti gun zealots to top Justice Department positions. Um, what do you guys think? The, the head of the ATF being re reasonably anti-gun, I mean, he's responsible for implementing the nation's gun laws. Uh, is this good, bad, indifferent? Andy Lander, I'll start with you. Trump's got me scared. I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, and, and this is going to kind of leach into the whole NRA thing, I, I think. So I won't try to go there, but uh, I think Trump tries to appeal to a lot of people and he says things and he doesn't actually get guidance. Um, and, and I think he's elected a bad choice. Uh, the ATF director is somebody that can make, I'll just put it this way, our lives a living hell. And uh, he can do that through, uh, through red tape. They can do that through a bunch of other things. So I, I would say that, um, that that's a, that's a, that's a bad choice. Um, so, you know, lately, um, I, I'm kind of worried, <laughs> you know, uh, especially when uh, your son is supposedly a big advocate of the, uh, of the, uh, suppressor and silencer community, you know, we yeah. come out and say, you know, I don't like silencers or, or I, I've never liked them. Well, uh, when you got elected, you know, shortly after your son was meeting with guys on the board there, you know, we were, we were having, we were hoping for the, uh, uh, hearing protection act. And, uh, now we're trying to ban them. So, or we're saying they're not good. So I'm worried. I'm worried. Um, I don't think it's a good move. So yeah, that's my I final agree. thought. Uh, Rob, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I do think it says a lot about uh, Trump and his real position and real thoughts on on guns. Or, and even if you're going to say, well, he's not getting guidance, well, that's because it's not important to him. I don't care what his son thinks. I think the industry needs to stop fawning over his son, quite frankly. Like, it's like, look at, the, you know, Reagan's kids weren't exactly like super conservative and awesome. Yeah. 
he didn't pose for Playgirl after his daughter was in Playboy. So I don't know what this connection, this perceived connection is. Uh, the, the connection between Trump, Trump and the NRA is troublesome because, you know, he owes us, right? He owes us through the NRA and he is not paying us back and he hasn't paid us back and he's done us some harm. And I think this is further proof that he's not pro-gun and we should not be saying things like, we're going to support him in 2020 no matter who he runs against because we don't like Democrats. He needs to be held accountable for his actions to the gun community. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that means we vote for the Democrat. I'm just saying 18 months ahead of time, we don't need to be giving him a free pass, especially right now. Yeah, I'm with you guys 100%. In the uh, in the files of oh wow, ATF is looking for thousands of guns and parts stolen and sold by an employee. So this guy has been been charged with a ton of stuff, but apparently a longtime guard at the ATF facility. And this is the uh, ATF National Firearms and Ammunition Destruction Branch in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh, apparently, he's been charged now uh, for stealing what they say the government says a significant amount of firearms and selling them. So apparently, he was stealing them he had complete access to the entire facility he's been taking them for years and years and years uh and then taking them to an ffl in pennsylvania i believe who was then selling them across the country now the way that he got caught was that uh, a gun came up in a crime and that gun had already been scheduled and marked as destroyed which i thought was interesting and in the article it actually says that the slide which i don't know how they would tell the slide because the serial number is on the frame but uh, i don't know if that's just uh miswritten or what it is but this this is a problem. I mean, they don't want to put all these things out there, but now we've got guns being stolen by someone who works at the ATF. And when the government says significant in quotes, uh, it, it definitely makes me worry. Rob Pincus. Uh, well, I was going to say your first, I mean, a lot of guns do, especially a lot of the European guns do have the markings on the slides now. So I think that is possible that they found that. On that. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously the FFL that was involved, right? I mean, there's a lot, there's a trail of people. It's not one, it's not just one guy. So they're, they're holding this one guy up and saying, okay, we caught this guy, but let's hope that everybody in that chain, you know, gets in front of prosecution because with some of these things, it's like, okay, well, we're going to get the FFL to testify against them and we're going to use that evidence to prosecute this one guy. But what about that FFL, right? Like now that what, they're not going to be prosecuted, do they still have a business? Is their FFL still valid? Because they had to be involved in this one way or another complicit in the process, right? You, you would absolutely think. And the other two people involved have not been charged. Only the guard at this point has been charged. So yeah, this is, I mean, this is a, I think this is a pretty big deal personally. I mean, we're talking about FFLs getting hit and we want to put new legislation in to make the penalties tougher for that. And we've got jerks like this, just walking around, taking whatever they want, putting it. Well, and I mean, ultimately I don't think the gun should be destroyed anyway. That's my opinion. And, but you know, this, this is bad. Andy, what do you think? Yeah, back to what uh, I was thinking when you said uh, serial numbers are only on the frames. You know, Glock serializes the barrel, the slide, and the frame. But, uh, you know, I mean, one, it, there's a possibility that the that the FFL didn't know. Uh, you know, if you're just somebody bringing guns in and dropping them off and, and saying, hey, I want to sell this, I, I, you know, but you show up with a bunch of the same guns that are high-end guns, I, I don't know. I mean, that maybe, maybe they were totally – unaware of what was actually going on. Um, I think it's a big fail at the ATF on the ATF side, somebody that's actually going through uh, with their company an ATF audit right now. It's just hard to take some people seriously when they start giving you stuff about certain things. And you're like, really dude, you know, I mean, you, you got a, you got a, a warehouse of guns that are walking out and you don't even know, but um, I probably shouldn't say anything, but uh, anyway, um, you know, uh, maybe this guy watched Lethal Weapon 3 too many times because isn't that the exact storyline of Lethal Weapon? I, I don't know. Um, I think so, yeah. I, I don't know what he was thinking, but bad mistakes. You know, prosecute this guy, uh, put him in jail. Um, you know, if you're in the business of doing uh, evil things with guns and getting guns into the hands of evil people or, or you're stealing them, I think you need to spend a lifetime in jail because you're complicit in some some possible major crimes that are that could happen with those, with those uh, tools. Yep. I want to move into our I'm offended segment uh, just because I want to talk about a couple things that they're trying to push through. First story is Dems pushed two new gun control bills. Um, this one is two major gun control bills. The first one is the Handgun Purchaser Licensing Act, which would incentivize state and local governments to implement a requirement that would be gun owners first obtain a license before making a purchase. Uh, this has been pushed in by a couple of House members, both Democrats. Uh, that followed a Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research study, which found that the purchaser, purchaser licensing is the only effective meth, method of screening potential gun buyers. 
Uh, what, first off, what do you guys think about that? Andy, I'll start with you. Do you think that uh, we should be required to have this education before we exercise a naturally given right? License is flat out registration. Uh, no, <laughs> you have to get a license. Uh, you're you're keeping that. Uh, you're, there's a record somewhere of you having a, a license to have something. So a absolutely not. Uh, it's just a way again to make it harder for somebody that possibly really needs a gun. Uh, to, uh, in, in, from preventing them from actually obtaining them, uh, somebody who's being stalked again, back to what I said earlier. But uh, no, absolutely not. I don't think somebody should have to obtain a license. Uh, it's pretty clear, you know, shall not be infringed in the uh, in the uh, Constitution, and and I, I believe that that is a full blown infringement. So, Rob, uh, yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with the study. I'm kind of curious about how they came to that conclusion and if they're yeah. including background checks like the the ncis check uh, as a licensing permitting product i, I just that that quote like kind of astounds me and i don't really want to comment until i get to read that study it doesn't make any sense to me off the off the cuff yep uh, second piece of that second piece of legislation reintroduced a proposal to stem the publication of digital files or code that could be used in conjunction with a 3d printer to manufacture guns at home out of the oversight of federal firearms manufacturing rules uh, this bill, if passed, would outlaw the publication of digital instructions or code or just the STL files or anything else that you would be able to use to, to print any of that stuff right there. Uh, besides not being able to outlaw that, enforce that, or anything else in the universe, it's ridiculous. Rob, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts? It is. It's nonsense. It's, um, you know, I mean, I'm sitting in a building where there's all kinds of cool you know, lathes and tools. And if, if I want to, like, build something that's going to fire a piece of ammunition, like I could do that here in 30 minutes, probably faster than a 3D printer could put all the parts out. Now, eventually, are we going to get to, uh, you know, Star Trek, you know, go over to the replicator and, hey, I need uh, an MP5 because, you know, H&K can't make an affordable and portable clone to just make me one in the microwave? Yeah, I'm going to get to that. And that's cool. And there's still rules. I think that's the problem with that whole quote, right? Is like outside of the oversight of rules, there's rules and those rules affect manufacturers and the rules affect people who build guns for their own personal use. And there's nothing wrong with that. And people are scared of new technology. Ah. Andy, 3D printing, uh, you think they can stop it? Well, I just don't think they can legislate technology. Uh, I mean, I, I was watching a show on Netflix. Uh, actually, what's funny is it was called Ghost Guns, and it was a documentary about these uh, guys in the Philippines that are that are making 1911s, exact copies of Springfield Armory 1911, including the serial numbers uh, with hand tools. Uh, you can't, you can't let, you can't regulate that stuff. I mean, this is just a, a kind of a scare tactic. Oh my gosh, you know, you shouldn't be able to print a gun on your on your on your uh, desk. Uh, you know what? I, I gave you the thumbs up because eventually we're going to get to technology. If the, if the world's here long enough, we're, we're going to have that Star Trek technology that I want an MP5 and it's going to print me one, you know? Uh, so, yeah. you know, I'm in. <laughs> it's the best thing I've ever heard. I, I think it's a complete waste of time. I mean, the, the, the focus, the problem is they put so many resources towards stuff that they, that really would have zero effect where they could be allocating resources to something that actually would make a difference that, that that's to me, the real problem. Um, yeah, I agree. And I mean, you could still go to Lowe's and buy the parts pretty quickly. And you really can make a zip gun fun. at Lowe's. Yeah. Like a death wish three. Sorry. I'm a, I'm a movie night after that lethal weapon thing. No, man, I'm, I'm with you. So the <laughs> next, the next one that they're trying to push through, they're seeking to annihilate the PLCAA, which is the protection of lawful commerce and arms act, I believe is what it stands for. And that basically protects manufacturers, uh, I, we've talked about it on the show many times, but it protects manufacturers from liability and litigation when someone misuses their product. You know, like if someone goes and drives drunk and, and crashes into somebody and kills somebody, you can't go sue Nissan for that. Um, but yeah, they have pushed that through or they're trying to push that through and they want to basically repeal that, get rid of it, uh, which A, I don't think is ever going to happen. B, it would be pretty devastating. The gun companies would drop like flies if that actually did happen. People wouldn't be able to get guns. So it's, I mean... They are. They do want to take all the guns. They, they, they talk about compromise, but really, they just want to take everything. Rob Pinkles, we'll start with you. Yeah. Any, anybody who who is pushing that kind of legislation, I know that a lot of people like just colloquially when I'm, I'm sitting around and I'm talking to people who aren't like gun industry people or even people inside of the gun industry, this issue gets so misconstrued, right? If somebody ships a gun that is uh, mechanically defunct, if it's if it's not operating the way it's supposed to. 
they can absolutely be sued on a product liability basis. This yeah. issue is, as you said, you described it perfectly. If somebody takes a car, takes a Nissan and runs over six people, can Nissan be sued for that? Which is ludicrous. It would be just as ludicrous to take a gun company and, and sue the gun company because the gun fired a lethal projectile really fast and really straight and it hit someone when someone purposefully pointed at them and pulled the trigger. Like that's how guns work. Right. That's what's supposed to happen under those circumstances. The gun company didn't do anything wrong. It was the circumstances that the user created. Right. That's what's the, that's what the problem is. So a lot of people misunderstand this and they think it means the gun company can't be sued for faulty manufacturing or for poor quality control. And they absolutely can be and they have been as they should be. Right. And that's that product liability is a whole separate issue from this. And I think that's important to make really clear. Andy. No, I, I agree with him. I the one thing that, you know, again, uh, if, if this goes through, you won't have an Advil bottle, a car, uh, any type of tool made because people, manufacturers will be afraid. I mean, you could sue for anything. Uh, but I agree as far as, you know, if, if I hate to say, well, if Glock makes a gun and when I shoot it, it blows up and it pokes my eye out, it's defunct and I use factory ammunition and it's doing that to uh, many people, then, then that's a manufacturer defect. And yes, you should be able to sue the manufacturer. Uh, they make a trigger that goes off when, you know, when it's not designed to, yeah, that you should be able to sue the manufacturer. But um, as far as trying to sue based on third party negligence, absolutely not. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's crazy. That's, that's like minority report, man. There's another movie quote. That's like minority <laughs> report stuff. You know, well, we can't, no, no, I 100%. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Uh, that's it's a disaster. So, uh, the final final stories from our full auto news segment: Alabama man wanted for methamphetamines and an attack squirrel. And uh, this this one, I saw some stuff online, and people want us to cover this. But first off, have either of you ever wanted an attack squirrel? Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to let Rob speak. But yeah, I did see that. I, I've seen the pictures. Uh, I, I don't know if it was the squirrel, but. Uh, that was pretty cool. No, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, meth or Coke or whatever the drug it was on is, is a good thing, but man, having a tax squirrel, that would be pretty, yeah, they would be pretty cool. Yeah. They received tips about it. The, the squirrel was being fed meth to keep it aggressive. And I guess to make it gun related, they found uh, body armor ammunition and that squirrel in a cage, but man, what, uh, what a time to be alive, Rob. I got nothing. <laughs> I don't either. Um, I, I ended the story just a little bit early because I want to talk uh, to you guys about what you've been up to and where people can find you. So Andy, uh, we, you and I have talked, uh, we, we did a little bit of stuff together just uh, about the NRA and uh, some of the things you were unhappy uh, in the beginning. I mentioned that you were a former NRA employee, now government contracting and firearms instructor. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the NRA and Andy, I just, you know, Talk for just a couple minutes about kind of what you think, where it's going, et cetera, et cetera. Well, right now, the the NRA is, um, well, the wagons, I guess, have circled. The uh, the people that are being questioned are kind of digging in. Uh, and for those of you that, that aren't aware, you know, there's um, there's some things that are going on at the top uh, financially that are, that are questionable. Uh, I, I've actually seen some of that firsthand. Uh, interesting thing is I was at a, I'm not going to say what type of event it was, but I was at an event this weekend and uh, there was 20 to 30 NRA employees there that I knew personally. Um, and um, out of 30 of them, uh, I think 29 came up to me and said, hey, the article you wrote, the open letter you wrote, I just want to say thank you. And, uh, you know, we appreciate you giving out a voice for us. Um you know the the NRA is in trouble. The NRA is in trouble. They're uh, you know they keep saying uh, guys like Willis Lee, who I, I I you know I can't believe somebody at the top hasn't hasn't looked at Willis Lee's Facebook and said, look, you just need to stop talking because you know when I was an employee there, the biggest thing they told us is you do not engage. Period. You know if somebody calls you, um, you know something terrible online, you don't go after them and, and say nanny you know nanny nanny boo boo. I'm I'm a I'm an NRA board member or whatever. Uh, Willis Lee's off his rocker, in my opinion, yeah. uh, the guys, the guys losing it. Um, Completely insane. Delusion. You know, um, and he's posting this stuff about, you know, being on the high horse and how, you know, he's got internal knowledge. You know, I was there 13 years and, and you know how many times I saw you on my floor, Willis Lee? Bingo. That many times. I never saw you walking around the sixth floor on my side, which is where the programs happen. So if you're listening, 
um, you know, sorry, man, I, I don't believe what you're, what you're, what you're, what you're selling. Um, but He's anyway, incredibly poor representative, uh, on, on social media it is it is ridiculous anyway sorry to interrupt no no what's funny is i've actually i've, I've i hate to say this i've i've been at events with willis lee I, i've actually had I, i've eaten dinner near willis lee at events with willis lee and talked to him when i was there and you know when things were when, when things were great uh you know i i had good conversations with him but but no uh, you know for somebody who's been a board member for for only two years and then suddenly to become the second vice second vice president i believe um that alone should tell people that there's something wrong. You know, you got guys on the board like uh, like Robert Brown, you know, Soldier of Fortune magazine. Robert Brown, that guy has been a loyal board member, outspoken, and um, and nothing. You know, guys like Alan West, uh, he's a, he's kind of a newer board member, but you know, he's got kind of a better record than I think than Willis Lee does. But um, you know, th there's problems. You got you got high paid executives that that are now saying, oh, uh, yeah, we fixed that. You know, you're not paying me $5 million anymore. You're paying me $1 million, so um, we fixed it. So, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years. You should just let me stay. Well, that's not how this works. You know, you, you know you've you kind of violated that that trust there, and, and honestly, the leadership isn't there. And what's funny is, you know, we start with Rob. We, we started this organization, Save the Second, and it, people are probably going to say, well, what's this about? You guys want money like everybody else. No, actually, uh, we, obviously money is going to be needed to, to, to do things. But what's funny about it is my five-year plan with Save the Second is I hope we're out of business in five years, honestly. I hope I'm out of business and I don't have to do this crap. I, I've been asked by multiple people to run for the NRA board. They're like, Andy, you should, you know, you're outspoken. You know a lot about it. I'm like, why would I want to do that? You know, I see what you guys go through and no. <laughs> yeah. um, but but with organizations like, uh, like what we started to Save the Second, I hope We've sent our message. We've helped fix the problem. And what's funny about this is our message is basically saying to the 76 board members who we hope to reduce dramatically is lead us. You guys need to lead us. You know, you can't have board members like certain individuals. And I'm going to use names because you know what? You're on the board. Julie Golop. Okay, she was on the board. She is, uh, well, you know what? I'm just a competitor. I just focus on the competition world. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a new board member. You're a leadership position. You need to actually get us out of these hard times. You can't just hide in the in the midst of 76 people and, and just, just pretend like this isn't your problem because we elected you to help run this organization, lead us, get us through these hard times. Um, and that's not happening. You know, everybody that's asking questions, they, they try to silence. So, um, you know, again, in five years, save the second i hope we're not even around i hope we fix the problem i hope we've gone away i hope the nra is flourishing you know uh people have called me even a fud i called an nra fud the other day and i'm like really you know i didn't even respond to it I was, whatever dude but um you know people need to wake up members need to see what's going on especially folks that are that are um in a little bit up there in years i mean i, I talk to people all the time and say why is this my problem and i say well you really want to leave a legacy and leave nothing for your kids i mean one of the biggest things that people that nobody's talking about and i said this in another interview is the nra's youth programs has been cut dramatically when i was there we had five full-time staff members that were handling organizations like Boy Scouts, 4-H, Royal Rangers, JCs, Church Assembly of God, ROTC, all these organizations that involve the shooting sports. You know how many there are now? There's one employee that handles that, and I think there's 27-plus youth organizations. So Adolf Hitler said, give me a generation and I'll change the world. Well, in 10 years, folks, 10 years, the world's going to change because the generation, every year we get a different generation of people. And if people don't wake up and people don't realize that the NRA has deviated from their mission of training people to use arms and, and, and especially our youth, we're going to have a serious problem in 10 years because we're going to have 26 year old kids because if they didn't get out of the military, you know, they're probably not involved in a youth organization that has anything to do with guns. So in 10 years, we're going to have 26, possibly 30 year olds that are going to be like, never touched a gun before, never seen one where in the past we had. So um, there's some serious issues. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll let, I'll let Rob <laughs> say some things. No problem. Thank you, Andy. Rob Pincus, the floor is yours. All that.
Yeah. I mean, you know, Andy was uh, inside the halls, you know, he's seen uh, some of the, the financial malfeasance and seen some of the missed opportunities. He's, he lived through the era where I think the NRA really pivoted to a hard position of, of niche marketing and, and really stopped lobbying, stopped trying to educate people in the, in the middle ground, let alone change any minds on the other side and really just kind of pandering and fear mongering to a small niche. That's been my biggest complaint, you know, about the NRA for, for approaching a decade now getting kind of louder and louder, um, including when I ran for the board in 2014 and was asked by the executive officers of the NRA to step aside, ironically, because of a perceived conflict of interest, because I was doing business with the NRA in our DVD program. Meanwhile, you know, and, you know, it's unfortunate that, that, you know, Julie becomes the target of this conversation because she is the perfect example of the person who we all respect and, and like. But at the same time, I don't like that she's, you know, sort of sidestepping all the hard issues and saying, well, I'm stuck, you know, because I uh, work for Akron McQueen on the TV show and I took the board position knowing I wasn't going to be able to talk about any of these issues. Well, maybe you should have let somebody else who could actually do the work take the board position. And maybe it's time to step down if, you, if you're in that position where you can't actually do the work. You can still do a lot of great things as you always have for the shooting sports. And I think that's part of the issues of, of Save the Second. When we say we want the board to be chopped down, the, you know, at least 31 people or at the most 31 people, I should say, chop that board down so we get rid of the people who have these sort of honorary, you know, I'm a celebrity, Tom Selleck, Carl Malone kind of positions where they aren't really doing anything. Get rid of the people who are there but don't want to do all the work. Because what happens is, especially if it's somebody that's very likable and has done a lot of good things and a lot of people respect inside of the community, they get a pass, you know, and it's, it makes sense. Well, there's 76 people, 75 other people can worry about that thing. Problem is that empowers those who want to just consolidate power in the back rooms and say, well, there's 76 people here and, you know, 32 of them don't really show up, don't really care, can't do the work, are in over their head, aren't paying attention, are distracted, or only here for their own, you know, self-promotion. I mean, you look at, like, um, I had a lot of high hopes for Anthony Calandra, right? He spoke a big game about coming in as an outsider. Silence, right? Mm -hmm. he, he got the endorsement from the executive committee and or from the executive officers. And as soon as they were campaigning for him, he went silent. You know, he's not the, the tough guy. Now he doesn't answer to anyone. Well, guess what? I think he answered to the people that actually tried to get you elected uh, as, you know, on the membership side when you said you were going to be an outsider. And now you're just an insider uh, who's been silenced. Well, he, he's not just silent. I've seen, a, I saw an interview or something that he did or a statement that he did somewhere talking about how, you know, everyone's attacking the NRA. We all just need to stop doing that and, and get on the same team and do that. So he's, it's even worse than being silent. He is so quickly just slapped everyone in the face who thought that he would be an agent of change. Yeah. But, uh, right. I mean, hey, he has, he's got a big overhead at that big, nice range. He had some investors build for him. He's got to pay the bills. He's got to make the business happen. And I'm sure he's making some deals and making that happen because now he's an NRA board member and that's kind of how it works. But it's a disappointment, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. Rob, do you want the NRA to go away, burn down, whatever it is? No, um, I will say, as I said in a, in a statement yesterday, you know, we we have five points that we'd really like to see. Right, make the board smaller, set up term limits. We'd like to make sure that member engagement is increased. We want the member engagement to be not just about go vote for who we tell you to vote or send us money. We want members engaged in what the NRA is actually doing, the programs. Right, let's get more members involved in the committees and not just employees or you know buddies or family members doing the doing the uh, the, the paid thing in some of the insider moves as well. You know, we want to see things like um, stop focusing on identity politics and divisive issues and, and don't be a front for the ultra conservative side, you know, of the Republican Party and get into immigration and get into, you know, the mainstream media demonization, get into uh, abortion issues. Let's stick to guns, right? Let's, let's get 100 million people on board. So these, these points that we have, that's what we want from the NRA. Right. What we don't want is for the NRA to just go away. What I don't want is for a superficial, you know, Wayne LaPierre resigns, nothing to see here. You guys were right. You got your way. It's not about Wayne LaPierre. This is about a systemic and strategic change at the NRA to steer it back to where it should be so it can fight for every American's right to keep and bear arms, not just, you know, the maybe five million people who are super ultra conservative and want to listen to Dana Loesch complain about MSNBC as much as they care about their guns. And that's a big problem. So I don't want to see it go away. I will however say, if it goes away, there are plenty of state organizations and plenty of national organizations and those resources don't go away, right? If, if say there's $400 million going to the NRA this year, if 
50% of that went away, but 200 million were distributed proportionately to the size of the other organizations in the community without the NRA buying suits, buying flights, throwing dinner parties, going on big hunts and doing everything else they do with Tony Macris and everybody at Akron McQueen for the last two decades. Well, guess what? That'd be more money than SAF and FPC and GOA and all of the state org that had come into their coffers than ever before when it had to get filtered through Fairfax. So I'm perfectly happy with 50% of that money going away, but going to the people that are doing the work on the local level, all politics is local and that's fine. Obviously our relationship with the White House that cost $30 million of NRA member money didn't do us much good the last couple of years. So I'm not afraid of the NRA going away, but I don't want it to go away. I want it to fix itself. 100% agree. Uh, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna touch on something that Rob kind of hinted at. You know, it's funny as he talked about uh, immigration and abortion and stuff like that. And 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 people that are watching this program, people say, "Man, that's a that's a new thing." You know, no, this is stuff that when I was at the association, this was stuff that six seven years ago. And and I, I'm not going to use names, but but uh, I will tell you this: uh, it, it came out of some individuals in our in our law enforcement area where our instructors for the LE program were getting upset that the NRA was focusing not just on training and, and, and education that they were getting into these, you know, terrorist, uh, you know, NRA TV. And it's, by the way, folks, for those of you watching, it's not NRA TV, it's ACMAC television. Okay. It's not run by the NRA. It's run by another company that, you know, all that stuff uh, that uh, Dana Lash puts out and all this stuff that it, those are things that, that, that the NRA is not really approving. So, but these are, these are concerns that were coming six, seven years ago from people that were inside the organization saying, why are you guys focusing on, um, on uh, ISIS? Why are you guys focusing on, on abortion? Why are you guys focusing on, on things like that? And people were leaving the organization. So yes, that needs to stop. I mean, uh, I remember when I first got there, I, we always heard is we are a single issue organization. You know what we care about abortion? We have zero opinion. You know what we care about uh, regarding, um, I, I can't even think of another, right. Uh, another big issue. Um, um, Electric cars. Yeah. You know what our opinion on electric cars are? We don't have one. You know, I mean, that was the, that was what we all we were told to say. And, and you're right. Our opinion was we were Second Amendment folks, but it has shifted so much that we are starting to alienate our own people. We're saying, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to go back to Willis Lee. Willis Lee, you know, if you listen to his radio broadcast, I think he said the word Democrat uh, 27, 30 times in one sentence, you know. Guess what, Willis Lee? There's Democrats that support the NRA. Yeah. Um, you know, there's people that believe in the Second Amendment. I mean, I work inside Washington D.C. I work with uh, with protective service officers. I walk up to people all the time that are gun owners, and, and the first thing they say to me because they they meet me and they call me Mr. NRA in my in my company, but they say, Andy, I just want to tell you, I'm a Democrat. And you know what I say to them? I don't care. <laughs> I say, Do you support the Second Amendment? Great. Let's let's go and shoot a gun. That's about what I say. I mean, um, it's good. It, it, but but you know, you get guys like Willis Lee. This I mean, here here's the scary thing. I, I, that Carolyn Meadows uh, article that she wrote about uh, that about that uh, governor of Georgia, where she said I, I can't I can't remember, and I honestly don't even want to repeat it. But where she said that the only reason that I and again quote help me if I'm if I'm not saying it right. And she said the only reason that she got elected was was because she was black. Is, is, isn't that kind of the basis of what she said? I don't, it, it wasn't exactly that, but I do believe that that it kind of hinted yeah. at that, right? Yeah. yeah. She needs to walk up in her own building on one, one, two, five, zero Waples mill road, because there's a lot of people of different colors that work in that building. Um, so, you know, these people that are running it don't even know who the folks that are there that, that work for them. So anyway, I, I'll get off my soapbox, but, um, no, I get it. Man. Well, Andy, go ahead, Rob. I was going to one more thing. I mean, since his name's come up so much, it's probably important in this at this point in the conversation for people to also know that Willis Lee is also a leader in the conservative movement to take back the Republican Party. So with him as the second vice president and him as the kind of loose cannon mouthpiece right now for the old guard and the status quo at the NRA, it's just that much more personally, he has a personal agenda and a personal investment outside of his work in the gun community to uh, engrandize himself inside of the, the CPAC world and inside of the conservative part of the Republican Party to take the Republican Party back for conservatives, which, by the way, I think sort of puts him at odds with President Trump and then therefore at odds with the position of the NRA. So there's a lot of complexity around his, you know, his smiling selfie face that he campaigns with is not all that's going on there. And I think people are starting to see that. Yeah. And I've said this on this show. I've said it on other shows. Thousands of people have heard 
many people have heard me say that he's fake. And if you're out there and you're a content creator, if you're you're someone who's high up and you're letting Willis Lee take selfies with you and call you as BFF, you're part of the problem and you need to fix yourself. Guys, we are out of time. Rob, where can people find everything that you're keeping up, everything that you're doing and keep up with you? On the internet. On the internet. Uh, Rob? Every, like everywhere. If you, can, if you can find the internet, you can find the Rob. <laughs> I love it, man. And uh, Rob, one word answer, yes or no. Are you on team Yeet Cannon? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Andy, where can people keep up with you? Um, right now on Facebook, uh, I'll friend just about anybody. Uh, they email me, Andrew W. Lander at, at gmail.com is, is where they can find me. I love it, guys. And is there a website for all this NRA stuff that you were just talking about? Go ahead, Rob. Uh, yes. If you go to save the two a.org, uh, you can also uh, obviously go find us on Facebook. We have a, uh, Instagram account now that's just up and running. And again, you can find a lot of those links through, uh, you know, at Pinkus Rob on Twitter at Pinkus Rob on Instagram and Rob Pinkus pro at Facebook. I love it. Go check out Patriot patch coming to guys. Thank you gentlemen for being here with me tonight. It's a great show as always. And uh, don't forget, guys, This Week in Guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and is a production of the Firearms Radio Network. We'll see you next week.